Welcome everyone to the fourth seminar of Public Sociology Live, a global course on the way sociologists interact with diverse publics in different places on our planet. Let me remind viewers that there are eight classes, including this one, <coughs> around the world discussing the video seminars and posting their summaries on Facebook. And you can find the Facebook address at the ISA website for Public Sociology Live. Well, today I am delighted to introduce to you Cesar Rodriguez Garamito, a leading sociologist from Colombia. He is talking to us from Bogota, where he is professor at the University of the Andes. There, he is and was the founding director of the Program for Global Justice and Human Rights. He's also a founding member of an exciting legal advocacy NGO called De Justicia. He has written and contributed to many books in English and Spanish on a wide range of topics, including internalization, internationalization of the law, labor movements, racism, and human rights. But most important for our purposes, he brings his sociology to diverse publics in Latin America around issues of environmental politics and human rights. The article we read for this week describes what he calls a social minefield, a wonderful metaphor that has three, in my view, three connotations. First, the mining of natural resources on the land of indigenous communities. Second, the landmines planted by guerrillas and paramilitary forces that explode in the middle of such local communities. And third, extremely risky, in fact, life-threatening social field that endangers indigenous groups, not just in Colombia, but in many countries in Latin America. A social field that stretches from the local to the regional, to the national, to the global. His description of the relations between state, the legal field, multinational corporations, NGOs, left-wing guerrillas, and paramilitary is, interestingly enough, very parallel to the account of Nandani Sundar, whose, whose account of Chhattisgarh we heard last week. They both address an issue that came up repeatedly in the Facebook discussions, namely the problematic nature of civil society. Indeed. Well, from these two cases, from India and Colombia, we now know that civil society is far from being a harmonious, peaceful, or even a wholly progressive entity. It is indeed a terrain of struggle that can embrace much conflict, even violent conflict. It can contain right-wing as well as left-wing groups. Sociologists, especially public sociologists, cannot be shoppers in a supermarket choosing what we like and leaving behind what we don't. We have to take civil society for what it is, even as we dream about what it might be. Well, that's my little introduction. Now we move on to the seminar um, with César. Instead of the usual practice of a 15-minute lecture, César and his colleagues have prepared a wonderful short video for us on public sociology in Latin America, or his public sociology in Latin America. Um, so let us first of all welcome César, and then we'll have the video. So César. Now we're going to do some pyrotechnics. Uh, are we going to let's watch, see if we can switch on to the video? Beautiful. Yeah, this is all very experimental, this course, but we are going to get there. Very good. Let me now take you to the practice of public sociology in the own locales, in the same lo in, in the locales that I work in. And I'll do this by talking a little bit about a project that I'm completing that started with an article that was published in English in uh, the Indiana Journal of Global Legal Studies in 2011 that was entitled Ethnicity.gov, Global Governance, Indigenous Rights, and Environmental Justice in Social Minefields. 
This is a project about the growing uh, conflicts, socio-environmental conflicts in indigenous territories throughout Latin America and actually throughout the world. Uh, as mining companies and natural resource extraction companies also, hydroelectric dam uh, builders, move into previously untouched, uh, quote unquote, territories, where indigenous communities have been uh, secluded for centuries. And the project is about capturing the tensions, the conflicts, uh, in what I call these social minefields. Social minefields in that they are literally built oftentimes around a mine, a gold mine and coal mine, but also uh, minefields in that they're highly risky, dangerous, in that the sociabilities that uh, um, predominate in those places are highly volatile. So this is what I try to capture with the idea of social minefields. There are many of these, but I'll just mention some that I have done field work in. One that's uh, very uh, recently become part of the news, international news, is located in the Brazilian Amazon. This is the Belo Monte hydroelectric dam, which will be the third largest dam in the world. And that's been built by the Brazilian state in association with private companies uh, in the heart of the Brazilian Amazon. In uh, in, a in, in a territory that, uh, that cuts across indigenous uh, lands. Uh, this has become a, a very famous uh, um, project because the Inter-American Human Rights Commission just last year, 2011, ordered the suspension of the construction of the Belo Monte Dam uh, and asked the Brazilian government to first consult with indigenous peoples who inhabit those areas. And this is by virtue of an international treaty, ILO Convention 169, that mandates the uh, state to consult with uh, indigenous peoples before um, occupying and exploiting their territories uh, for natural resource extraction or large development projects like a hydroelectric dam. This is, you may have heard about this um, case because that's where James Cameron, the director of Avatar, went and, and uh, did some activism that to his mind had uh, represented what he wanted to convey in the Avatar movie. And this is him with uh, one indigenous leader from the Mato Grosso region in Brazil. Similarly, in the Peruvian Amazon, in a place called Bagua, in 2009, a Big, flight, big fight, very violent conflict exploded between the Amazonian uh, indigenous peoples and the Peruvian police that led to the killing of several police uh, officers and put the issue of consultation with indigenous peoples and the issue of mining at the center of uh, Peruvian politics. And nowadays, uh, it's still at the forefront of uh, public policy discussions and politics in, in, uh, in Peru. These are images from uh, the conflict and the, the raids uh, by the Peruvian Amazon in the region. Then similarly in Guatemala, uh, the Marlin mine, which is also gold mine, um, exploited by a, a Canadian company, led to a similar conflict and led to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, which is a human rights international agency based in uh, Washington, D.C. that was created by the Organization of American States to get involved and also ask the Guatemalan uh, government to stop the exploitation, exploration of, of this mine until, uh, the, the, until uh, the consultation with indigenous peoples uh, was conducted. Finally, a, a case here in Colombia called uh, Urra, which is also a hydroelectric dam in northern Colombia, in a highly uh, violent territory that's been the sort of the, the headquarters of the right-wing paramilitary movement, and uh, has uh, this case has until the construction of also the, this dam in 1993 without consulting the indigenous peoples, despite the fact that the 1991 constitution in Colombia established this legal duty. We've actually done with a colleague a whole study, a uh, book length uh, case study uh, on URRA. The last example that I want to show you, these are all pictures from uh, field work that we conducted there. So with this in mind, let me 
decompose uh, very quickly this project beyond what you see in the academic article, which is what professional sociology and professional sociologists would see and would focus. And they actually, I have engaged, we, we engaged with colleagues in the social sciences, in, in legal academia, on the details of uh, the idea of prior consultation and the ONILO Convention 169 on social environmental conflicts and so on and so forth. So that's the more professional side of the uh, project. But what's behind it, and this is what I would like to do for you uh, in the remaining of, of this talk, is to open up the black box of public sociology and show you what's behind scenes, what's behind in terms of other types of activities uh, that would not classify as professional sociology. The first one then, uh, uh, the more conventional one is the research agenda. But even the research agenda, and this is the point that I want to make here, is informed by public sociology uh, purposes. Uh, and a central issue like uh, case selection is affected by the logic and the of public sociology and the engagement with other audiences, with grassroots movements, with uh, the media, with international organizations that they, like, like the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, and so on. So how, do we, how, how did I select the case studies for this uh, project? Actually, I'm turning that piece into a book length um, manuscript that includes not only the URA, a case which is the, the case highlighted in the article, but also the uh, two more cases. And this is how the uh, project evolved from one case study to the other. I actually got into this project, into this issue, uh, through the door, through the gate of policy work. I was asked by the Colombian government in 2006 to work on a project that would eventually lead to a, a, a draft version of a bill to regulate uh, the um, prior consultations with indigenous peoples in Colombia uh, so as to be uh, in agreement with ILO Convention 169 and with the rising um, activism for uh, indigenous rights around the world. As part of that policy work, I did a lot of field work. Being sociologist, I was interested in, in going to the places where these consultations were taking place and seeing what was actually going on. So I went to URA in northern Colombia, the, the place that I told you uh, is the headquarters of the Colombian uh, paramilitary movement. And in doing the field work on URA, and while I was doing the field work on URA, the uh, and then published a uh, piece on URA, the Bagua conflict in northern Peru exploded. And through links that I had with uh, Peruvian NGOs, I, I was uh, invited to give talks and, uh, to uh, indigenous communities and also to NGOs in Peru about the experience of prior, prior consultation in Colombia. So that's how the Bagua case and, uh, and the uh, Peruvian uh, conflicts got incorporated into this book uh, manuscript. But then, just a couple of years ago, uh, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and also other organizations, uh, NGOs uh, throughout the continent became increasingly interested in socio-environmental socio conflicts and indigenous rights. Just because of the sheer fact that these conflicts were multiplied, were, were getting, were proliferating throughout the region. Uh, so we went uh, to Washington DC and did a thematic hearing before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights with a number of NGOs from the Andean region. And I participated there in my role as a academic slash legal scholar. I have to admit and that before becoming a sociologist, I was trained as a lawyer, so that informs my work and also adds a legal component to it, a legal advocacy component to it. And finally, the same Inter-American Human Rights Commission, before uh, which we had appeared in, in 2011, decided to stop, to ask the Brazilian government to suspend the construction of the Velo Monte Dam. And that's how the Velo Monte case study, which is the third case study in my manuscript, got incorporated into uh, the project. So as you can see, this is a very different um, process of case selection from conventional uh, professional sociology. 
there's an advantage to this type of research agenda, which is, of course, that you see things as they emerge. Okay, normally, there's an, I spend a lot of time and I still have my base in academia, but there's a big time lag between the events and the time when academics get their act together and go and do field work and write about those uh, issues and those uh, uh, conflicts. So five years or more can uh, go by until there's an academic writing on a conflict uh, like these ones. So one advantage is, of course, that you have immediate access. You're asked and you're welcomed because you're also doing legal advocacy, public work, things that communities see as relevant and useful to them. Uh, and also, you see things, as, as I said, as they're emerging. Uh, so you uh, start writing and start reflecting upon these issues uh, when, as they're happening. And so you can anticipate, anticipate the importance of issues like socio-environmental conflicts. Of course, there are drawbacks uh, to this strategy, which is, for, for instance, that you have to be careful to maintain some academic scholarly vigilance about uh, whether or not the selection of cases makes sense. And I did in this, for example, in this particular uh, research design, I was careful to choose uh, among many other conflicts and, and cases that we had get, gotten involved in in the different countries, uh, those cases that had some variation uh, across the uh, dependent variable that uh, complied with basic methodological uh, standards. Let me move, move on quickly to the other arms of public sociology of this uh, windmill. The second one you may recall is public engagement. I engage this and I, I go about doing uh, this by combining different types of writings, by producing different types of writings for different types of audiences. So the paper that you can uh, check out in web, in databases, so in academic databases, it was published in Indiana Journal of Global Legal Studies. But what's not visible in those databases are the newspaper articles, for example, that I have published uh, as part of this project. I've, I write an, uh, a bi-weekly column in a national newspaper in Colombia. I write longer pieces for uh, the, are also in a national newspaper. I write for blogs. And this is a, a piece that appeared in a Sunday edition of a newspaper called El Tiempo in Colombia. And I've also written in, uh, mostly in El Espectador. And the trick here, at least the way I try to go about uh, engaging the public in these different types of genres, is to write a complete in, in, a, in a different register for different audiences. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the difficulties and the complexities and the drawbacks of doing this, but in terms of public engagement, I would highlight uh, this combination of writings uh, for different audiences. So of course, the newspapers reaches out for to uh, to a much wider audience and uh, leads, for example, to media appearances in the radio, in news, in, in TV shows, and so on and so forth. The third arm is policy work, and in the case of my own work, in the case of the, the group of people that I work with here in Colombia, uh, it also entails legal advocacy, uh, just because we use law, and I'm trained as a lawyer as well, and, uh, and this is a powerful tool for uh, influencing policy. These are images from a uh, hearing that we did uh, before the um, UN Committee Against Racial Discrimination in Geneva a couple of years ago. And there, as you can see in the image, we appeared before uh, the committee uh, because we wrote the shadow report to the Colombian government's reports on, rac on racial discrimination that included indigenous rights, uh, indigenous people's rights, uh, and the violation of indigenous people's rights, and also the violation of uh, the rights of Afro-descendant communities in Colombia, which have also been heavily impacted by socio-environmental conflicts and by large development projects in the Pacific coast. So this is um, the translation of academic work of research into uh, international legal advocacy and policy. And finally, institution building and communications. I, mean, I add here communications because where we're in the 21st century and we're all aware of the, the power of uh, transnational communications, of uh, social networks, of video. Uh, this is actually one of the reasons why I'm doing this today. Um, so 
in every type of, of institutional effort that we made in this along uh, for the last few years that I've been involved in this project with a group of very talented lawyers and researchers, we've made an effort to build institutions and communicate what those institutions do to a wider public. I'll mention just three institutions. <clears throat> the first one is my academic base at the University of Los Andes, Justicia Global, a program on global justice and human rights, which is a legal clinic that brings together students and faculty who work on projects on legal advocacy projects and research. Uh, and I've been to uh, this, many of these locales with um, students and some other uh, faculty and uh, young researchers who are part of the Global Justice Program. Also, uh, an, an NGO that I uh, helped found, the Justicia Center for Just uh, Law, Justice and Society, has been involved on the legal side of, of this equation. Also, researchers and lawyers from the Justicia, which is an independent NGO that does um, the legal advocacy side of the projects, has been instrumental to this. And I've been involved in uh, pushing forward this type of work uh, with the Justicia. And finally, we have created coalitions. Uh, these organizations, along with grassroots organizations, for example, have created some um, coalitions, like this is the website of uh, Racial Discrimination Watch, Observatorio de Discriminación Racial in Spanish, which does advocacy research uh, and mostly um, popular education programs uh, in indigenous and Afro-Colombian uh, Afro territories in, in, in the rural areas of Colombia. This is uh, actually what guarantees that this type of public sociology uh, uh, work and approach uh, can continue and can be passed on from generation to generation because there are young lawyers and scholars being trained in all of these institutions who actually, when I tell them, well, this is not exactly what gets done in every in, in conventional sociology department, they say, well, this is what we understand sociology has been or and actual legal advocacy has been. For, to them, it's clearly more natural to do, it comes as, as natural to do this type of work as opposed to uh, what a student in a, a conventional sociology department would uh, think. Finally, let me close with the dilemmas. Of course, uh, all of this <clears throat> sounds exciting and it, it is exciting. Uh, and I enjoy doing this and, and I see people enjoy it uh, and I see uh, researchers uh, uh, young researchers enjoy it, and especially when they make a, a difference in policy work, in, in, uh, in popular education programs, in different types of uh, activities. But it is also an idealistic, a very highly demanding and complex uh, activity. And this is why in this uh, animation, I ask myself and I ask you all whether there's something, something quixotic about uh, public sociology. And as you may recall from Don Quixote, the most famous novel in uh, Spanish written by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, uh, Don Quixote uh, tackles, uh, he fights against uh, a windmill. So this is why also I wanted to use the windmill metaphor, because he takes, he confuses them for uh, giants. So it's actually, he says, there, it's, he just runs into a windmill in the middle of, of the countryside, and then he says, well, this is a, this is a, a giant attacking us, so I'm going to face him and confront him, right? So there's something that can be something delusional, uh, something risky about doing, uh, taking on this quixotic enterprise. And let me highlight four risks uh, quickly. First one is dispersion. One is that you're constantly shifting between activities. You're constantly moving from talking to the media to uh, teaching a class to uh, traveling abroad to appear before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights to um, spending a lot of time writing a budget uh, to raise funds for your institution. So your mind gets dispersed and you get distracted all the time. Second risk uh, that's associated with the previous one. Uh, dilettantism. Of course, quality research requires focus and time. If you cannot um, take aside some time 
for thinking and writing, then your academic production begins to suffer. Uh, and there's a serious risk, risk of becoming a, 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 an, an academic dilettante. The third one is dependence. Of course, if you have all these ties with the government, uh, with social movements, there's always the risk of you being co-opted by the priorities and the activities and the agenda of, act of uh, actors other than your public sociology um, niches. And so you constantly have to engage uh, in solidarity, for example, with social movements, but maintaining your independence so that they, so that you can remain useful to the broader uh, effort, for example, in this case of uh, protecting indigenous people's rights or protecting the environment and fighting against climate change and so on. And likewise with the government. You want to engage with the government, but without being an advisor, without uh, being uh, taking the government as a client uh, that you have to be responsive with. And finally, and this is obvious, burnout. <laughs> you get burnt out. You get tired all the time. If you do, uh, if you do this, and actually there's a really nice line in Michael Boravoy's uh, piece on Eddie Webster where he says, when the winds are gale, it is impossible to get close to the windmill without being drawn into its vortex. That resonated very powerfully with me because I had described to my students and to people who work with me uh, the sensation that I have on a daily basis oftentimes as being in a, in a vortex where you get drawn into a constant, um, into a constant uh, like a hurricane. So this is certainly uh, a risk and actually graphically it may happen that the windmill <laughs> rotates, spins so quickly that it destroys itself. And then the, the Don Quixote loses the battle. And then he has to withdraw and then you get burned out and, and devote yourself to some, something else. So this is the big risk. Still there? You're still there? Cesar? Yeah, Very sure am. good. Very good. Okay. We're just trying to get you full screen, I guess. Uh, just a minute. We'll get you. Don't just hang on a second. Sure. Very good. Okay. Get all the stuff off. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, that was fantastic. Um, and uh, you know, I see you're not burnt out. That's that's very that's very reassuring. Um, actually, for viewers, um, uh, this is part of a slightly longer video. So if people are interested in the. Uh, broader, slightly broader picture and the story of the windmill. They can, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put on the blog, um, the blog for this course, um, uh, the actual extended, extended. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Very quickly. The, the, um, the idea of the windmill, as you will see in the full version, comes from a paper that Michael Bravoy wrote on Eddie Webster, a great um, public South African sociologist. So the first part when I talk about the arms, is based on a prior description that I gave in the full version of uh, Michael's paper. So if you want to um, understand the idea of the metaphor, uh, which is very rich, I, I urge you to look at, to read the paper. It's uh, entitled Southern, The Southern Windmill. And if you're interested, to take a look at the full version of the video of the talk. Yeah, it is, of course, interesting. It is the, the southern windmill. The interesting question is whether public sociology implies being in a windmill, if one's in, particularly if one's in the south, the global south, and uh, when one has to do all these things all at once. Well, anyway, this was great. Um, so uh, we now have time for questions. A uh, good 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 25. So who would like to begin? <coughs> Min, very good. So, um, after hearing a bit about the windmill metaphor... How oh, says If you cannot hear us, just shout. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Min. 
Okay, so um, after hearing a bit about the windmill metaphor, I wanted to ask you, how do you actually negotiate and handle the competing pressures? Um, how do you personally avoid burnout when you have so many things to balance? Okay, I'm assuming that that's the only question you guys have because it'll take me a full hour to try to answer it. <laughs> so you're the representative to the whole class. Um, so very quickly, in the last, in the full version of the video, what I tried to do in the last segment is make my best effort at answering that uh, question. And briefly, what I, what I've uh, been thinking in terms of addressing those dilemmas that I highlight in the video that I just watched is to try to bring together those different strands, those different uh, little threads that are somehow loose uh, into hybrid strategies. That is, if I found very difficult to sustain different styles of writing, for example, to be as active in professional academic circles as I am in um, community circles, right? Uh, so, and I've, that's what I've done so far mo in most of my projects. That's, that's an avenue that there are great examples of uh, uh, well-known public sociologists who do that. Uh, one example that I like to quote because he's somehow my mentor in, in this task is Boaventura Santos, a Portuguese sociologist. He does that. Uh, one additional, one, one potential alternative to that uh, that's not inimical to to that type of work, but that tries to bring together different strands is to develop, for example, a hybrid writing style, right? Something, a writing style that draws on the strengths of academic writing. So it's strong on data, it's strong on, on the theory, but in terms of style, it's more um, easily communicated, transmitted to wider audiences. This is, of course, hard to do. I'm in the process of struggling with this issue in this manuscript, and what I found particularly helpful is the work of what in the U.S. are called literary journalists or uh, some odd exceptional anthropologists like uh, Wade Davis, who wrote a magnificent book. Uh, he's written very well-known books. Uh, one that I particularly like is entitled One River. He's now a story in residence in, National, in the National Geographic Society. He's Canadian. And he's written about indigenous rights issues. But when he does that, he uses the techniques, the narrative techniques of literary journalism, say of the type of the best writing of um, published in The New Yorker, the magazine. And that's, of course, hard to do. And I don't think that any, any full-time academic can do that. I certainly cannot do that because Otherwise, I would be writing for The New Yorker. Uh, but uh, you can borrow some of those techniques uh, and experiment with your writing styles so that it becomes interesting, appealing, relevant to both audiences, to, to different worlds, both uh, in academia and outside academia. Uh, th so that's, that's one strategy that I'm, I'm experimenting with. Good. Well, as you say, we can, you, people can look at the, the longer version of the video and see all the other strategies of dealing with, with the potentiality of burnout. Okay, so, um, are there, what, who would like to ask the next question? Devine. Um, you just talked about how you engage with different um, publics by practicing different writing styles or practicing a hybrid writing style. And I was wondering, um, other than engaging with like media and newspapers and radios, um, how do you engage with um, interventions in the minefield, sort of with the indigenous population or the NGOs? That's a key too. Uh, I when As I listened to the video, I realized that I focused most of the talk uh, the bit on public engagement, on engagement with, me, with the media, but actually I think the most um, time consuming and demanding type of engagement is with the actors in those cases. So for example, I'll give you one concrete example. 
last year, and that was after we did, uh, we did the first uh, case study on URAO, on the Colombian hydroelectric dam. It, we were asked by the national organizations of uh, indigenous uh, communities, ONIC in Spanish, the acronym, to work with them, to accompany them as they negotiated with the government, as they engaged the Colombian government in the process of the writing of a key law and that's called the victim's law, basically that creates a reparation system, a transitional justice uh, system for indigenous victims of the uh, civil war in Colombia. So last year, we traveled around the country with uh, the indigenous leaders and also with uh, government officials and met many times here in, in Bogota uh, with both actors, with both, both types of actors. And in the process of doing that, turned some of the lessons from the academic study into um, pedagogic materials, popular education materials for indigenous peoples in those territories, not just Urra, but in different other regions that are going through the same processes of natural resource exploitation or, or threats of natural resource exploitation uh, to understand the stakes and to be aware of uh, the legal framework that uh, applies to those cases. Um, it's, uh, as I understand your question, you're also asking about whether that sort of creates conflicts of interest or sort of uh, creates um, difficulties in dealing with the two hats that you have. On the one hand, you're a researcher. On the other hand, you're maybe a legal advisor or a, or a popular educator. Uh, that's always a struggle. I've known of very talented uh, human rights activists and uh, Actually, I've worked with some from the U.S. who find this uh, insurmountable, an, an insurmountable ethical dilemma. And, I've, and I've, uh, my answer to that question is always, well, if you're doing it genuinely, if you are transparent about this, well, your help is greatly appreciated and needed. Uh, so, but I know that these conflicts and these dilemmas can be immobilizing and, and, and because they're difficult. And let me just add one quick uh, point to that. I realized that in the video, I'm always talking about we, 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 and we went, and we have written, and so on and so forth. And I realized that I felt to highlight the fact that public sociology, at least as I understand it, and as I practice it, is a collective enterprise. So I'm not doing this alone. I write, and this is an important issue. Many of the things that I write, uh, especially those human rights reports, are always co-authored. Uh, and then it's always tricky to know what piece is yours, your research, and what piece is more of a collective effort. I, I see most of it as a collective effort, certainly institution building, definitely a popular education programs, and, and in that sense also there is some contrast to conventional professional sociology. Very good. Yes. It's a very important point. Public sociology has to be collectively organized and we should be thinking and talking about this collectively as we are indeed across the world to, to, to understand different strategies coping with similar situations very good uh, who would like to go next yes dominica um well speaking of collective efforts uh you talked a lot about institution building and in your article you wrote that um the consultation approach it, it stimulated some kind of political mobilization not only among the communities but also by activating networks. So are public sociologists the ones who can activate those networks, switch them on, as Castells would say? That's a great too. Uh, one thing, another strategy that I mentioned in the full version of the video is translation. So I don't think that public sociologists are the ones to activate, to trigger uh, the coalitions necessarily, but they definitely can play a, a fundamental role of translation, and this is actually a term that I'm taking from Boaventura Santos' work, who argues very powerfully that uh, public intellectuals and critical sociologists, critical scholars, <clears throat> have the structural location and also the um, skills, language skills, research skills, to engage different publics. And, and when I, so when I say that translation and being the, the role of translator suits 
public sociologists, I'm thinking of many types of translation. Also, in, uh, of course, we're talking about doing public sociology in a globalized world. Many of these movements and communities that, that we engage with uh, do not speak uh, English or any other language. I would, actually, some of them do not speak in Spanish. Uh, so one direct service that a public society can um, um, pay and can uh, a, a role that can fulfill is to serve uh, as translator between different worlds. Of course, it, that also creates a host of problems and dilemmas, but it's immensely useful. We've translated between languages, we've translated between, of course, translated between legal language and sociological language. That's already a kind of translation, right? So between social science and law, between um, the policy language of policymakers and the political grassroots language of community activists, between the language of a corporate codes of conduct, uh, of the mining companies, for example, and the language of uh, social responsibility at the local level in the communities. So in all those types of translation, I think that there's promising uh, work for public sociologists. Very good. Yes. Anybody? Who's next? Yes, Andrew. Hi. Uh, so in your article that we had to read, uh, you're really uh, critical of the legal framework, uh, specifically the juridification of the relations between like indigenous people and other actors. Uh, but it seems like you're really like heavily involved in the legal side, especially legal advocacy. So I was wondering if you see that like as a contradiction, or if you see the same power relations playing out with your engagement with your publics. Mm -hmm. That's. Tricky question. It's it's something that, of course, highlights a potential contradiction because it's one, and it's partly because of different languages. When I write for an academic audience, I take for granted, for example, the critique of neoliberalism, right? The critique of liberal legalism, the critique of hegemonic globalization, and so on and so forth. But then, when I engage other publics, say the government officials that are putting together a draft bill on prior consultation or um, corporate um, members, you know, uh, lawyers who work for uh, international corporations and so on and so forth, that background information is not shared. Uh, and certainly, and, and also, of course, the concern in those conversations and also the concerns in those Pablo, in those prior consultations actually on the ground with uh, indigenous uh, leaders in communities, the government representatives, is not to make a convincing theoretical uh, argument, but actually to make a difference in terms of the protection of indigenous people's rights in that particular case. Uh, and in those cases, in those situations, I am much less skeptical and much less critical about the potential of the legal framework. For example, the International Labor Organization's uh, 169 Convention, which is, some, is uh, the main piece of international legislation that I analyzed in the paper. And, and I say something to this effect towards the end of the paper. It has made a difference in terms of the protection of indigenous people's rights. It's not the ideal international framework. Certainly, it would be best to have a higher standard of protection of indigenous people's right to participation and, and, um, and uh, self-determination. But I've seen it make a difference when indigenous communities wield that legal uh, argument, legal tool, uh, to their benefit. So if I'm glad that none of you, and you, you are getting close to that, so I guess this is the last time I'm going to do a, a, a Skype talk uh, for Michael, because you're finding all these contradictions, right? So if, if you <laughs> went with me to the uh, ground in the community, you say, well, you're not as, as critical as you are in the paper about the, the potential of the vegan framework. Yes, there's, there's that tension. Uh, of course, it's on the margin. I, basically, the idea of being honest and transparent and uh, making your views um, public, systematic, and consistently, which is, of course, part of, of the ethics of, of public sociology. But it's not as straightforward as you can imagine, uh, as, as it can be in professional sociology. Yes. Working in the real world is a contradictory business, right? Right. 
Perhaps you should add that to your sets of dilemmas. Or perhaps they, basically they all embrace that, yes. Right. Very good. Who wants to go next? Well, I got a... Ah, Matt. Hi, I have a question. Um, in your paper, you bring up how um, the indigenous leaders started to encourage a lot of their members to go to law school so they you know, can better participate and represent themselves. But I'm just kind of curious on how many actually followed through with that. And if they did, like, if they like, actually came back to you know, indigenous people. Right, that's a so key question. One thing that you realize in doing this type of work is that, um, well, you're certainly <clears throat> doing some useful work, but it's not as useful as if those communities, in the case of indigenous peoples' uh, communities or uh, the other uh, ethnic uh, community that I've worked with a lot, these Afro Colombians. Um, had their own legal advice and had their own leaders with the requisite training to bring these cases, for example, before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights or the National Constitutional Court or other uh, venues. Now, uh, that's a longer-term project. We have started to uh, move in that direction through a program that we created last year with the support of the Ford Foundation, which is uh, basically an affirmative action program for Afro-Colombian lawyers who are interested in pursuing a master's in law degree in the U.S. in human rights. And actually, we have a bunch of, of uh, students at an English language school in San Diego, not far from where you guys are, um, because they're going to be applying to law school next year. So in the hope that there's some transition process towards a more autonomous leadership and, and um, expertise. That, however, will probably be a decades-long effort. Uh, and it's not necessarily us who will be um, pushing it forward, but uh, it's not as immediate in terms of results as, say, writing a... a an article, a, a scholarly article or a, or a human rights report and appearing before an international human rights sentence. Good. Yes. Oh, who wants to go? I actually, I, there's a question I would love to ask you. Lale. Yes, Cesar. Is, um, so last week we had uh, Nandini Sundar with us who also, has, her work is, is similar in the sense of she also works on, on indigenous communities, and she doesn't use the term minefield, social minefield, but also in, in, in quite violent and, and um, risky kind of situation, right, where similarly paramilitary groups, all these kinds of forms of violence on the ground. Um, and in her work, we got to read a little bit of, of how she tries to, to negotiate that, but how it is that she attempts to be a public sociologist in such a, a violent and risky situation. Um, because we only got to read your one piece, your one professional sociology piece, I was hoping maybe you could kind of share a bit with us. Number one, how is it that you actually go about trying to be a sociologist, public or professional or otherwise, in a social minefield? And how do you also try and ensure that the work that you do doesn't come to have consequences for the people that you work with? Um, so your own safety, their safety? Right. Great question, too, and one that doesn't have an easy answer, because this is something that sort of you play by ear. Uh, it's, these are minefields. So you, first rule is that you never show up unannounced, and uh, you, always go with someone, you always go with someone who's from the area and who in turn knows what he or she is doing. Um, so we'll, every time we visit these zones, we do it at the invitation of a local organization of indigenous peoples or Afro-Colombian peoples or uh, internally displaced people. And uh, there is an immense amount of trust involved. And this is you know, as far as I, as I can go in terms of giving you an answer, because whether that trust is um, supported by facts, whether you can trust local folks 100% when they're in turn are under death uh, threats 
and do not themselves have the full situation under control. But still, there's sort of a, a chain of trust. And in this, as in any risky situation, you work with very few people you trust all completely. Uh, and uh, so I, this is how I visited those places and how I continue to go uh, to, the, to these and other regions. I'm working on other projects that are also taking place in highly risky places, like the Colombian Pacific Coast, for example, nowadays is the main route to, for the drug business to Central America and then to, on to the U.S. And we used to, uh, we've been working with communities on the Pacific Coast close to the border with Ecuador for six years now. It didn't used to be that dangerous, but it's become very dangerous. And just a couple of years ago, I was there with Angela Davis, the great African-American uh, activist, uh, in, in solidarity with the community leaders who were getting um, threatened, and some of them have been killed. And uh, so you do your best, you're not stupid, and you hope for the best. And now, I know that this is not a definitive answer. You know, it's not as, as crisp as you guys would like to uh, hear from me, but it's, uh, it's, that's the nature of the work. I, of course, try to avoid uh, situations in which I deem the risk to be excessive and, to be in, and the risk for me and for the, uh, the researchers I work with and the, for the communities involved. But there is no rule of thumb, really. Yeah, and there's sort of you read the situation, it's like the, uh, and, and you learn to read the risks and, and not, um, and, and to avoid being stupid, which is, again, not very um, <laughs> concise and precise, but when you're in those situations or you're invited to places, you, it, it becomes more precise uh, than I can express at this moment. But perhaps you can, I mean, uh, talking about not being stupid, I mean, are there times when you realize that it is stupid to stay around and then you just leave immediately? Yes, yes, and that's the that's, uh, difference between, uh, between the role that I think we play as public sociologists and certainly the groups that I work with and humanitarian workers, for example. I have an immense amount of respect. For example, I've run into members of uh, peace, brigade, peace brigades in many of these social minefields, and they stay there all the time. And their role and their job is to stay there because that's the only way, because they're Canadians, they're from the US, they're from Europe, uh, the stakes for a guerrilla movement or paramilitary squad um, in terms of killing these people in the communities and the uh, international workers and the uh, humanitarian workers is higher. So they know that by just being there, just walking around that area, staying with the community, then they raise the costs of those violent actors um, uh, when they want to perpetrate human rights violations and kill or uh, kidnap or displace the local um, communities. I, I have an immense amount of respect. I think that takes an immense amount of courage, but that's a different role, and certainly that's not the level of risk that we tend to assume. But still, it's, you know, doing public sociology in such minefield is very different from what we might normally think of in this country doing public sociology. So it's very important that we grasp how it really looks very different in different places. Yeah. Right, right. And so it's, there's probably one more thing about that, which is <clears throat> that it's an ongoing relationship. This is not uh -huh. a situation in which you sort of get into the field, do your ethnography, pull out, and then forget about the case because the case haunts you, so to speak, because you have established trust. With, those trust relationships work both ways. So with the wrap, I'm done with the paper. I'm done with, actually, we produced a um, book-length manuscript, which is coming out in Spanish with um, a junior colleague of mine. And, uh, and so officially, the case study is done, right? But I'm still involved very often in, in the follow-up to the case. And I would never dream of turning down an invitation to uh, talk to the same people that I already interviewed, because of course, the, even as I explained in the video, the starting point for the case study had nothing to do originally with this article, with the book. I didn't have the article of the book in mind when I went into that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>
So public socio is not just a matter of making one's work accessible, but when it actually turns out to be accountable to different publics, which means a long-standing relationship. Yes, a big right. commitment. Amazing. Yeah. And you can't say, well, I'm too afraid now to go back. It's, it's part of the deal, right? You feel like it's part of the understated, under, uh, un, and, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the subtext of the relationship. Good. Well, does anybody want to ask a last question? Micah. Um, hi. So in your article that we read, you talk about the emancipatory potential of the legal framework, but it sort of seemed like at best it's just able to stall the projects. So I was just wondering in terms of emancipatory potential, do you think that that will come from a legal framework or from somewhere else? Or can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Yes. Uh, what I mean by that is that because in the paper I'm skeptical about the most uh, optimistic views of uh, the international framework of indigenous rights as being emancipatory, I highlight some contradictions, some serious limitations of that framework. Uh, I didn't want to end up the paper on a sort of a, I want to be skeptical but not cynical. And, uh, and I have actually, I love, um, I don't have it at hand, but Richard Kapuczynski, which is one of these people I view as a model of, of how to write about social conflict. Richard Kapuczynski is, uh, was a Polish uh, journalist who lived most of his life in Africa and wrote about Africa for many decades. And he was interviewed shortly before his death by an Italian journalist, and he said, well, tell us about the requirements to become a war journalist, or someone who cares so deeply about the victims of war, of human rights violations. And he, his answer was one line. Well, this, is, uh, this job is not for uh, cynical people. Uh, and so cynicism really is... And, and that's something, and I know this is going to be recorded, but uh, cynicism is something that when you do this type of work, you tend to, um, to spot quickly and to distaste uh, in professional academic circles. Because in, in, um, in professional academia, the more conventional type, not this type of uh, workshop of this type of sociology, uh, well, you can be cynical about, for example, the potential of uh, human rights at large. And there are legal scholars, very well known, who have devoted their lives to discrediting the human rights framework. And, and they can do that because, well, they don't have to go to these communities and say, well, we answer the question, what can we do with ILO Convention 169? What can we use, uh, what can we take from the international human rights framework to push back vis-a-vis the corporation that wants to build this dam or the government that wants to push us, push us aside uh, to allow the, the dam to, uh, the construction of the dam to proceed. So I definitely want to uh, uh, be cynical about the potential of the international legal framework. So towards the end, what I say is that, well, as any type of, interna as any type of legal framework, ILO Convention 169, which is the international framework on the prior. Hello. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Hello. Ah, Hello. Ah, you're back. Very good. Yay. Okay. You're back. Yes. ILO yes. 169. Yes, 169 is which is the international framework that regulates prior consultation with indigenous peoples in the context of large development projects and that it has internal contradictions so it was negotiated between the ILO international labor organization is composed of workers employers and states and as can, you can imagine these different constituencies have different interests and different worldviews so they had to come to an agreement that necessarily left many things unresolved and uh, and there are open ended clauses in the in ILO Convention 169 that have, can be exploited and have been exploited creatively by international human rights lawyers, by indigenous leaders, by public sociologists, public intellectuals, 
And that's what I try to highlight towards the end of the paper in terms of the emancipatory potential of prior consultation, of taking empowerment seriously, not the, you know, the World Bank version of empowerment, but the community uh, bottom-up version of em community empowerment. Very good. So, I mean, yeah, so I suppose, you know, you're in, embedded in all these contradictions, and what you're saying is you, we should also try and work with the contradictions, in this case in the legal sphere, to see how far one can go. Um, right. Yes. So, so a bit like in old Gramsci, remember? Optimism of will, pessimism of the mind. Yeah. Exactly. I was, I was about to quote Gramsci, but I'm in front of a, a, one of the uh, best known Gramsci experts in the world, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, was really, that was really wonderful. I mean, it's really important that we sort of understand what it really means to be doing public sociology. And you're at the center of, of this windmill. And I really do hope that it keeps on spinning and it's real, it spins with gale force. And if you, it means that you have to take a rest from time to time, that's okay. You can come here to Berkeley or something. Um, <laughs> I will. <laughs> yes, yes. So it, it, was, it was really wonderful to have you with us um, and actually sort of uh, helps us um, move on. Next week, uh, next time we will have actually uh, Marta Soler and Ramon Fletcher who will be coming to us from Barcelona. University of Barcelona, where they head the Institute for Overcoming Inequality. I suspect that the public sociology in Spain uh, is, is rather different than it is in Colombia, but we will see. So really, let me thank you once again, Cesar, for a wonderful seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very good.